Thank you very much. So I'd like to talk today about Diplomacy 2.0. Now, what does that really mean? What I want to talk about is an unintended consequence of the consumer economic revolution, which is that the power of consumer consciousness is beginning to change the way human rights issues are developed and advanced. Now, what's interesting is all we ever hear about these days are the evils of consumerism and the evils of consumer spending. But as with any complex system, we can't control all the outcomes. And we get phenomena that we don't expect. And one of those phenomena that I want to talk about today is Diplomacy 2.0. And what's interesting about Diplomacy 2.0 is how changing social consciousness is changing the, the shape of state sovereignty and changing the roles that non-state actors play in shaping human rights. So as with any system, there are players. So who are the players in our play? The players in our play, and this is Diplomacy 1.0, which we'll be getting to, the players in our play are states, and you know states, countries. And then there are what I'll call MNCs, which are multinational corporations. You can all boo and hiss now if you'd like, but you can hold that. And then there are NGOs, right, which are non-governmental organizations like the Red Cross, and you can all applaud and be very hap happy and, oh, they're wonderful people. So we're going to talk about them. So in the ordinary world, the ordinary world that really existed certainly through the end of the Cold War and maybe a little longer. In the ordinary world, what were states? What do we know about states? States are timeless. They go on forever. And they think they go on forever. And they act like they go on forever. States are very status conscious. I'm the state. You're not. I'm big. You're small. I can do anything I want. States have always been driven by that. States are the lawmakers, especially as to international law where it's only things that states agree among themselves that makes international law. By consensus, if states, if enough states don't agree and you don't have a consensus, you don't have an international law. So states are lawmakers. Now what does that mean about international law? Well, what it means about international law is that there wasn't very much of it for a very long time, that it tends to develop from the top down, and that it tends to develop painfully slowly. It took World War II and all of its horrors, following only 20 years after World War I and all of its horrors, to finally begin to get international human rights to a point where we could say there were norms that protected individuals under certain circumstances. And that just shows you how difficult it is in a state-centric system to develop international rules. So those are the states. Okay, now the multinational corporations. Now corporations are fascinating things. They are pure fiction. They're not people. They are pure creation of law. I, there's on the internet, right, after the big Supreme Court case last year where the Supreme Court said, of course corporations are people. I know there's something going around the internet that says, I will believe a corporation is a person when Texas executes one. <laughs> so, so what we have now is corporations. Now they're legal fictions, but they are remarkably fascinating things. Why? They exist in a world of limited liability. Now what does that mean? What that means is, and for all of you who are going to be entrepreneurs, get this down because this is really important. Whatever money you sink in to a corporation at the very beginning, when it is formed as an investor, is the only money you ever have to put in. If the corporation fails, you owe nobody in anything. You don't go to debtor's prison. It's all right. You're fine. You have no debts. The corporation walks away. It disappears. It fails. But if the corporation succeeds and pays dividends to its shareholders, you can profit endlessly. So corporations have limited liability, genius concept. And what else do corporations have? Because they're only fictional. Corporations are transcendent, which is a remarkable thing. They can exist, unlike you and me, they can exist in more than one place at one time. So that means they are opportunistic. They are risk takers. They are designed to be risk takers. And that is why they are so successful. And that is why they help propel the economy. But because they are risk takers, they also will exploit situations. And traditionally, multinational corporations, what did they exploit? They exploited two things in the old world. The first thing is they went where legal regulation was low and exploited gaps in legal regimes. For example, the Hudson Bay Company comes here 
and abuses Native Americans to make money because there was very legal regulation of them. But yet they took tremendous risk in helping to develop the New World. Same thing with the British East India Company, same thing with the British West India Company. That's the traditional multinational model. And they exist to shift cost and profits around so as to pay as little taxes as possible and make as much profit for their investors. So that's our multinational. So what does that mean? Generally, multinationals do not see social responsibility as their problem, somebody else's problem. Why is it someone else's problem? Because they exist to make money. As Milton Friedman said in 1970, the only corporate social responsibility of a corporation is to make more money for its shareholders. So that was the old rule. And then you have the NGOs. Now, NGOs are interesting. NGOs hardly existed before the 20th century. The first real NGO was the International Red Cross, and the International Red Cross did not become truly international until World War I forced it to become so. NGOs typically were low funded. They typically were seen by most of us as the monitors and the data collectors. As colonial countries became independent after World War II, and as there was a drive for a need for human rights being pushed by those countries, NGOs popped up to keep track of those new rights and to gather data. They generally were not very media savvy, and they generally were unbelievably antagonistic to multinational corporations, who they hated. In fact, their favorite activity was usually urinating on the feet of multinational corporations who really wanted very little to do with them. And so this was Diplomacy 1.0. Diplomacy 1.0 is state-centric. The multinationals and the NGOs revolve around the states. They talk through the states. They try to influence the states, but it's all about the states. And notice how the multinationals and the NGOs try to have as little contact as possible because it was never pretty. Then what happened? The Cold War ended. The world had been divided up into neat little camps and it was all about keeping a balance so that we didn't kill ourselves with nuclear weapons. But that ended when the Cold War ended. And huge forces were unleashed. And those forces began to change the way diplomacy worked. So now we have first the problem of the state, the poor state. Little old state. Well, now little old state has a problem. Because in a post-Cold War world, what do we have? First, we have globalization. Now, globalization means a lot of things, but in particular, it means two things for our purposes. The first thing it means is unbelievably fast transaction velocity. Whether it's the internet, whether it's the movement of money, whether it's how people are linked together, things are moving faster than ever before. And who does that put at a disadvantage? States. States are unbelievably inefficient. They are not nimble. They're never known for being nimble. When you're big and lumbering and you go on forever, who knew nimble? You didn't have to be nimble. You just had to be big and you had to step on people who got in your way. But now states have a problem. Now there's transaction velocity. There's globalized communication and globalized linkage. And the other problem with globalization is that we have freer trade. So states can no longer seal themselves off from the world and be successful. Instead, in a globalized system, states are competing against other states. And so that's a pressure. All of a sudden, this space that they comfortably occupied that was quiet and big is now getting compressed. Now, what else happened? We started having raised public consciousness. In a world that was no longer neatly divided up into two camps where the only thing that mattered was, am I safe from nuclear war today? We now have a new world where people have a somewhat raised consciousness about things. And in fact, as the consumer economy has expanded, as people are richer and better educated, they have more consciousness about these things. And so people are asking more questions about the state and asking more questions about human rights and raising their expectations. Witness the Arab Spring, which is simply another manifestation of it. And finally, you have expanding rules of law. What's really interesting in a post-Cold War world is that all of a sudden we care about certain issues that we didn't necessarily care about before when all we worried about were the Russians and getting blown up by bombs. Now, we're thinking about issues like corruption and terrorism. We don't like corruption. It used to be we didn't like corruption, but during the Cold War we didn't take it as seriously. Now you have massive anti-corruption laws that actually have been enacted by 162 countries. Now we care about terrorism because it's no longer one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist, which was the Cold War philosophy. Now terrorism is seen as a universal evil, the new pirate, the new criminal of all mankind. Now what's really interesting is ask yourself, is there any major human rights violation over the last 
100 years that you can put your finger on that has not involved some aspect of corruption and terrorism. It's really interesting, right? The Nazi regime, one of the most corrupt regimes known to mankind, and also engaged in terrorist acts and also engaged in gross violations of human rights. So where we find ourselves now is we're starting to regulate with law things that we didn't used to. And that's meaning that states have less rooms for maneuver. Now what about our friends, the MNCs? Well, now CSR, new term, stands for Corporate Social Responsibility. Well now, the same forces that are driving the states are driving corporations. But instead of shrinking their space, these forces are pushing them out, pushing them to engage with the world in ways they've never had to before. So for example, heightened legal demands. They have to disclose more. Sunlight, remember Justice Brandeis, who said, gave us the famous statement, sunlight cures the rot. Well, all of a sudden, corporations have to disclose a lot more. They have to be more careful because there's heightened legal regimes. They have heightened transparency. People are telling them, I want to know more about how you do business. I want to know more about who you're doing business with. I care more about what goes inside, what's happening inside your corporation. It's not enough that you're just making a profit. I actually would like to know how you're making that profit. Every time we have a major corporate scandal, while we may not think the result of government regulation is forceful enough, there's no question that each scandal over the last 15, 20 years has caused more disclosure to be made. It's chipped away at the walls that used to exist around how corporations do business. And so you have heightened public expectation. All of a sudden, the consumer that's buying your good wants to feel good buying it. And part of feeling good buying it is feeling that they're not buying it from a criminal. And that's a change. And now what about those NGOs? Well, what's interesting about those NGOs, notice the circle's bigger. <laughs> NGOs have all grown up. NGOs are huge now. If you exclude the Gates Foundation, you look at the top 10 foundations in the world, you've got $50 billion in assets pulled together. In terms of operating human rights NGOs, we've gone from 6,000 in 1990 to 26,000 in the year 2000. And those NGOs have $750 million in annual income and have a lot of money now to spend on media and know how to do it better. And one reason they know how to do it better is they've been hiring from the MNCs. Now the other thing about NGOs that's very interesting is they've changed their outlook. They've matured. Part of that changed outlook is the idea that they no longer demand all or nothing. So it's no longer walking up to an MNC, wagging your finger in their face, urinating on their feet and saying, you're bad, you're bad, and you're bad, because you won't stop all child labor all the time. Now they'll walk up, and this actually happened. This is my example. This is a good example. The Cocoa Accords, which some of you may have heard of, the International Cocoa Institute and the Cocoa Accords. Now it turns out that there are about 12 countries in the world that make 99% of the cocoa we eat. And there are eight companies that buy 99% of the cocoa that is produced so we can eat it. It turns out that in certain countries in Africa and East Asia, there is huge amounts of child labor used to produce cocoa. Now it used to be that the NGOs would go up to the MNCs and say, you must stop doing all business with anyone who engages a single child in the production of cocoa. And the MNCs would shrug their shoulders and say, please, go away. I have nothing to say to you. Now the NGOs came up and said, well, wait a second. What if we were to stop urinating on your feet? What if we were, in fact, to tell the world you're really nice people? And what if, to be a nice person, you just have to start helping us reduce the amount of child labor in a way that is steady and sustainable? And all of a sudden, the cocoa companies, who like all of you to eat their chocolate and want all your children to grow up and eat their chocolate, the cocoa companies were thinking, well, now that's a different kettle of fish. That we might be able to live with. And so a few years ago, they signed the International Cocoa Accords. And the International Cocoa Accords have started to create a sustainable model financed by the MNCs, not government money. Millions of dollars of MNC money is now pouring in for a survey to be done across Africa of the places where child labor is the worst. And the cocoa companies have agreed to stop buying from those areas first and buy from other areas, areas where there's less child labor used. And they're going to start chipping away at child labor in places like Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. And that's a huge change. That, my friends, is diplomacy 2.0. That is what happens when states get squeezed and can't occupy the space they used to 
and other people are starting to fill that space. And what's marvelous about the Cocoa Accords is the way the governments, the same governments who for 40 years in the International Labor Organization of the UN had been unable to make a dent in child labor, how all those governments lined up once the NGOs and the corporations said, we have a fix. We have a way of dealing with this problem. And there were other examples of this happening. The Kimberley process involving blood diamonds in the Congo is another example of this. So diplomacy 2.0, what are its implications? Because it is real. It is happening now and it is happening every day. The implications are really interesting because the world is going more and more this way and that space in the middle is growing. The implications are that it's going to change the way power is projected because, it's, because states will now have an added angle with which to address human rights issues. It, change, it will change the way foreign aid is debated because, again, you can get more bang for your buck if you can get the MNCs and NGOs to help you focus on a particular problem. It will involve MNCs and NGOs increasingly getting together without states to decide how to address human, certain human rights issues. And interestingly, it will involve human rights issues more and more being addressed not at the macro level of the states, which is, this is bad, to at the micro level of, let's look at an individual problem and start figuring out how to solve it, and thereby set a precedent that will radiate outward. So we're changing the nature of the debate, and in changing the nature of the, the debate, we're starting to see how our world will change. And that's an unintended consequence that's going on right now in the area of human rights. Thank you very much for your time.